This conference will now be recorded. Well, it, it is. You, you know, it's hard for me to
Representative Carver, should, yeah. we, should we, would you like us to wait for a few minutes or would you like us to get started? Uh, Let's wait just a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. Okay, that sounds good. Nance, um, Rep Carver suggested we wait a couple more minutes and then we'll, well, you can get started with the welcome. Does that sound good? Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, we wait. Well, actually, I guess we do need to be respectful of people's time, okay. especially those that have sent their aid. So let's okay. go ahead and start. All right. And I'm, I'm sure he's worth his presentation for our hour time. Absolutely. Well, we even told him 45 minutes, so there's questions. We know you all have yes. to get out of here a little sooner. Yeah. So. Let's go ahead and, yeah. and get going. Okay. All right, Nancy, she's thinking that let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Yeah. All right, and you can use this. Oh, no, you're right. I was slow on the draw when you were talking. Outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, so much technology yeah. here. It's great. Welcome, everyone. Um, it squeaks. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but thank you for um, being here. Um, we have the privilege today to have Michael Gordy from, um, as the Boulder DA, who's going to talk about um, the data of felonies and what's the last part of that? It's a whole package. It's a whole package. Well, at that point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Michael. And did, do we want to sort of introduce the two folks who are here? Um, there, there is a democratic something something happening. And that's why we're so short on representatives today. But we have the best here today. So do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, uh, State Rep. Terry Carver. I represent Western El Paso County and uh, co-chair with Representative Jackson uh, and Senator Fields and Senator Gardner. Um, but uh, as Nancy mentioned, uh, the reps have many uh, commitments that they're trying to juggle, but we're thrilled to have uh, D.A. Doherty with us to talk about what we are seeing in Colorado as far as uh, rising crime rates of um, many different areas, and what is driving then the increase in the felony filing that we are seeing here in Colorado. Uh, very important to understand as we're looking at legislation um, dealing with criminal justice reform uh, that we understand what is going on with crime, both property crime, uh, crimes involving injury and death uh, to our um, fellow uh, Coloradans. And uh, unfortunately, we're seeing increases in crime across a number of categories. And so obviously, legislation that we consider in this session and future sessions needs to take into account uh, public safety and justice for the victim. So with that, D.A. Doherty. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Representative Carver. I'm really honored to be with you today on behalf of COVA to talk about victims' rights and also some of the exciting work being done here in the legislature. And I'm really excited about it. So I think we're at a crossroads in criminal justice in terms of criminal justice reform. And I say that as someone who's been a prosecutor for 22 years, I've specialized in sex crimes and homicides over the years, and met with uh, more than my fair share of victims, and that's one of the reasons I was honored to join the board of COVA. But I'm also very committed to and passionate about criminal justice reform. So we can make the system work better. And I'll talk more about that but I'm really excited to be here because I think this session that's already underway, as Representative Trauber mentioned, will include a lot of different criminal justice bills. And that's why you're here with us today. And I'd love to leave time at the end to take questions, but also take questions as we go through this. I'll tell you, right at the start, last night, as I was going over this, I was looking at this title, Next Steps, What Does the Data Tell Us? <laughs> I could have come up with a better title. So in a couple of slides, you'll see my revised title for this presentation. I'm going to just leave that as a teaser as we get started. But I do want to acknowledge the uh, sponsors, Senator Gardner, Representative Carver, Senator Fields, and Representative Jackson. And when I was first sent their names, I'll tell you that next to their names was a letter, an R or a D. And that's how we communicate so often when it comes to elected officials down here at the Dome. But I took them out. Because I think when we talk about justice, and victims and 
criminal justice reform, the R and the D shouldn't really matter. And I just really want to thank the four of them for their commitment to having this discussion and inviting us in and talk about how to make the system better, how to enhance public safety, while making sure the rights of victims are also preserved, preserved and considered. And COBA really appreciates this opportunity to be at the legislature to talk about the work they do on behalf of victims. One of the reasons I chose that title for this presentation, although you might think it sounds boring, you know, <laughs> is because I wanted to make this as objective as possible. So if I ask Justin Cooper, what do you think is wrong with the criminal justice system? He'll give me an answer, a bunch of answers. And if I ask Nancy Lewis, what do you think is wrong with the criminal justice system? She'll give me a bunch of answers. And their answers might be different. They might even contradict one another on some categories and issues. So I wanted to make this as objective as possible so we all could learn from it together and discuss it together. So I want to discuss it together. And welcome Senator Gardner, who's one of our sponsors for today's discussion. I really appreciate him being here as well. So my revised title for the presentation, and I'll tell you how I came about it, is The End is Near. The end is near. And I say that for a couple reasons. First, yesterday a water main broke in our neighborhood, and my daughter told me, as I was done with work, there's no water in the house. And I started yelling, the end is near, the end is near. And she has a good 12 year old to shake her head. And then I got in the car and I heard about this virus that's spreading from China through Asia, and I thought, wow, the end might be near. Uh, but nowhere I'd rather be than here with you. But the reason I put the end is near on this slide, actually, it's because often right now in the world of criminal justice, we are given what I would call a Hobson's choice, the Hobson's choice, the illusion of choice, that either you could be for public safety or you could be for criminal justice reform. One or the other, and that the two cannot coexist. You're either standing up and fighting for public safety or you're fighting to reform the system, and the two are completely separate. Hobson's choice. Who is Hobson's choice named after? Well, Thomas Hobson, who would rent out horses in England, and he had a huge stable of horses. So when you went into his stable thinking you had a choice of all these different horses, he would only give you the one in the front stall. And if you didn't want that one, you got nothing at all. It became Hobson's choice. I strongly believe that we can enhance public safety by improving the criminal justice. That we can make the public more safe and help more victims and prevent people from ever being victimized if we actually engage in meaningful criminal justice. And to do that, we have to recognize that these concepts are not mutually exclusive. Public safety and criminal justice reform are not two separate choices. We can actually engage in reform while protecting the public and doing a better job for those that we work on behalf of. So that's why I look at the data. I think in a lot of ways the data informs where we can and should focus our efforts in the legislature. And also looking at how reform should be achieved without sacrificing the accused or the victims or the process. And paying homage to all of those groups is something we'll talk about today. We're trying to improve the system by understanding what the data means and where it's taking us. So first, this is a slide that reflects the increase in felony filings through the state of Colorado in 2013 to 2018. And you can see it's gone up. The number of filings in 2013 was 36,582. Last year was 52,949 for a percentage increase 44.7%. So felony filings have gone up dramatically from 2013 to 2008. Let's talk about the categories in which these filings have gone up. So these are broken down and in case you can't see it. We're starting with 13 on the left, 2018 on the right, and it's broken up by crime category over that five-year period, reflecting the number of felony filings for each one of those offenses. So custody violations, drugs, you'll see there, and I'll come back to that. It's an increase of 5,921 felony filings, motor vehicle traffic, property, sex crimes, and I would note the purposes of this chart, 
that sex crimes is broken out separate from violent felonies. Theft has gone down, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Traffic violent, which has gone up by 3,708 over that five-year period. Why has theft gone down? Anyone want to have to guess? Ms. Goner knows the answer, but before she answers, I'll give everybody else a chance. All right, let's go to Ms. Donner. Ms. Donner, why has that gone down over that five-year period, if you have to take a guess? Um, I think it's uh, related to reform class in 2013, which changed the cut points. <coughs> Ms. Donner's help, the legislature changed the cut points from misdemeanor to felony for theft. In two that CCJJ uh, proposed changes to the theft statute, so it went from $1,000 and above for a felony to 2,000 and above for a felony. And that's why you see the one category where it's gone down over the five year period is theft. I think that's a direct, direct result of the work done here at the legislature. So just for a point of reference, I wanted to show you, these are the Boulder County numbers for the 20th Judicial District over that same five year period. Uh, custody violations 123 has gone up. But the greatest increase for us has been also Violent crime, 197. Felony, violent felony increase from 2013 to 2018. And I put it into a more simple chart that's easier to read. You can see there the increases in our jurisdiction in the 20th from 2013 to 2018. So in 2013, we had roughly 1,862 felonies, 605 of which were violent. And last year, we had approximately 2,500 Family file, 900 which were violent. Can you say this per capita? By population, you mean? Yes. So the increase statewide is 44.7. If you incorporate population increase, it's 33%. Good question. So I want to return to the Hobson's choice for a minute as we look at this data. So if you look at this data, you might be concerned. You might be concerned about too many felonies being filed. You might be concerned about too many victims. You might be concerned about what the heck's going on in the state of Colorado over the last five years. There's, any, there's a number of different ways to read this data. There's a Hobson's choice. We think about it public safety or We can do both. We should be doing both. That's one of the few times in this presentation I'll give you my opinion to try to make the reason I say we should and can be doing both is, well, I'll give you two case examples. One is the gentleman who looked at his case as part of the reentry council. We have a group in Boulder that studies reentry from jail and prison back into the community. And we're doing a lot of work with that group over the last year and a half. And one of the case studies we looked at recently was a gentleman who from 2009 to 2019, so 10-year period, has been booked into the Boulder County Jail on low-level offenses 70 times, 70 times. He has spent five of those 10 years in jail on low-level offenses due to mental health issues and substance abuse, 70. You don't have to, it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent or from outer space. I think all of us would realize and agree that we could do it better than that. There should be something in place when it's the 10th time or 20th, how do we let that get to step? When you think about the number 71, think about the police putting handcuffs on him. Think about the impact to his life. Think about the time and resources that go into that arrest. And he's brought to the jail, he's booked by jail staff. Then he's transported to the courthouse and he has a public defender assigned He's paid by the state. There's a prosecutor on the other side of the courtroom, paid by the state, by the county, actually. Uh, that's a separate presentation. <laughs> the, the judge is sitting there, paid by the state, all paid by the taxpayers, whether it's county or state. And we're going to prosecute him for number 71. We can do better. There should be a recognition that when we're talking about those numbers, that we could be doing better. I'll give you one other example along those lines. A guy named Brent who uh, 
about a year and a half ago, I met friends at a homeless shelter in South Boulder. And he shared with me that he has a mental health condition, and that when he's not on his medication, he tends to get himself in trouble with the police. Huge guy, by the way. Uh, he's telling me the story. He's been arrested 35 times in the last five years in Boulder. 35 in five years. All low-level offenses. What can we do to keep him from being arrested 40th time on the bed for 50 years? And I had a long conversation with him about our mental health diversion program, which is now up and running in Boulder. We'll talk more about that. And then the following weekend, I was walking with my then 10-year-old twins, my elite security team, who I think is that. Mm -hmm. I saw some big guy coming out of the corner of my eye, and I heard, hey, Mr. DA, and I jumped out of my skin. Uh, but it was Brent coming up to talk about how he was doing. But for guys like him, we have to do better. But this morning, I was up in Longmont preparing for a trial that I have starting next week, where the individual who's accused in that case had gone into a family's home. He's a complete stranger to them. They left their door unlocked on this particular night, which they never do, but their grandparents were staying in the RV in the driveway. So they left the front door unlocked in case they needed to come in the house. And instead, this guy, a complete stranger to the family, came in the house, went upstairs, into the bedroom of the 11-year-old 11, 11 girl, asleep in there, and started the sexual assault. What should happen with that case? So these are different sides of the same kind of issues that we're talking about when we talk about criminal justice. But the increase in felony filings, and in Boulder there's also been a corresponding increase in misdemeanor traffic cases, is something, as Representative Carver talked about earlier, that we have to consider when we talk about reform and we have to consider when we talk about how to make the system work better for all the people I just described. For all the people I just described. And I had the privilege of being on a panel last night with Representative Herod and up in Boulder with individuals who have been formerly incarcerated talking about their stories. We had hundreds of people come to listen to their stories and talk about how do we make the system work better when you hear their, their lives, when you hear how they ended up in the situation they did and where they are now. So why do we think there's an increase in violence? Who wants to guess? There's no right answer for this necessarily. Why the increase in violence? There's a decrease in services, mental health particularly. Okay, so decrease in mental health services. Senator Gardner, what do you think? I think it's those really hardcore district attorneys who uh, are just filing more and more cases. All right, well, I appreciate That's what I hear. <laughs> so uh, that is a legitimate question, is it the DAs? And what I would say in response, and I can only speak uh, well, I would say this, when we, if we say it's the DAs, we'd have to recognize that we have 22 different elected DAs in different jurisdictions around the state, different philosophies, different approaches, different communities, but the increase is being seen generally statewide. It's not just one jurisdiction having a different approach. It also overlaps different DAs. So as you know, there have been different DAs elected in some of those jurisdictions over the past five years. Uh, and I can tell you in Boulder, we haven't changed our charging practices at all. And we've seen an increase in misdemeanors and traffic. So I think anything you see an increase in felony filings, if you have the thought that Senator Gardner just voiced, the response should be, well, have you changed your filing practices? And what's happened with misdemeanor and traffic? So I think that's a good question uh, for us to consider. What else is driving the increase? Felony DUI law. Felony DUI law? Okay, so we have felony DUI DUI enacted in certain as new crime. And for that reason, we're seeing more felony DUI. What else? First thing, what would you say? I don't know. Because I think that there's been efforts to do the analysis, but I don't think that anybody knows. I should be honest. We can speculate here. Probably multiple factors. Something's going on. Did you have your hand up? Okay. So I think it's complex, and I don't think there's a right answer. But I do think it's population growth statewide. A lot of people would realize Colorado is an amazing place to live. We still have the felony file numbers getting down. Lack of mental health services, too little substance abuse, treatment available in the community. 
the rise in drug addiction and drug use, and also the rate of reoffense. Representative Carver? Uh, D.A. Doherty, this is a document that came out from the Colorado Division of Criminal Justice dated October 2019, and the title, Exploring the Increase in District Court Filings in Colorado 2013 to 2018. And I was just going to mention a few things here and, and wondered if that's what you're seeing in your judicial district. Uh, they talk about um, uh, drug possession being kind of a subset, of uh, one charge among um, other charges that are being filed. So it could be a drug possession charge with a property crime or a... Uh, more charges involving drugs associated with what we're seeing in double-digit increases in other crime categories. But it was interesting in the analysis that they talked about the defendants, many of these defendants, another trend they're seeing is that they've got multiple criminal cases going on and their analysis um, raise the concern that perhaps the what we're seeing is individuals with more severe drug addiction that then is manifesting in greater criminal activity. Um, but as far as some of the other numbers, um, the 34% um, uh, uh, increase um, for a drug offense, that's not limited to drug possession. Uh, violent offenses increased 21.3%. That's where the cases had a violent offense as the top charge. Uh, property offenses um, increased 15.7%. Uh, and then motor vehicle theft <coughs> increased 8.4%. So again, those are statewide numbers. Right. How does it look in your judicial district? Is it Similar or? It is similar, yes. So those okay. numbers for violent and drug cases are similar <laughs> in Boulder as they are on the statewide numbers that you just uh, provided. And if you're interested, the state has broken out those by jurisdiction. I'd be happy to send those to you in a number if you have them already. But we have them by statewide, but then we have them by jurisdiction as well. And it's really interesting to look by jurisdiction, how different things are happening in respect to jurisdictions. Alice. I would also add, um, I'm in the first judicial district attorney's office, and we've seen a pretty significant increase in the last five years in our felony domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that we would um, say as a result of more identification of strangulation and the change in the strangulation law. Um, so I think we are, some of it I think for us is from that, but I will say we've also seen an increase in our misdemeanor domestic violence cases also. So it's not that they're going from a misdemeanor to a felony, we've just seen an increase across the board. Right. And I hope maybe more victims are reporting. So that's one of the things I was just about to say. I mean, and these are really complex issues. We have with too little time to talk about it today, but I think one thing that's driving some of the increase perhaps on DV cases and sex assault cases, at least in Boulder, is that we're having more reporting of sex assault in DV. That's not a bad thing. So if people feel more comfortable or compelled, encouraged to report, I think we want to see that happen more often. So I don't look at the increase in sex assault and DV and have a reaction that the end is near. My reaction is, okay, this might be a product of people being willing to report more, and it's just the numbers are the same, perhaps even lower than these. So we just had an increase report. I do think, to Representative Carver's point, this is something I strongly believe uh, is that we need to have more treatment available in the community. We have a lot of programs now available in di different jurisdictions, not enough, but it's in the criminal justice system. So you shouldn't have to hit the doors to jail or the courthouse to get treatment. You should be able to get treatment for substance abuse and mental health in the community. And the more we do that, more likely we are to lower the rate of reoffense. And I'll touch briefly on drug cases. I appreciate Representative Carver bringing it up. Drug filings increased by nearly 6,000. I showed you that number earlier. So we went up by nearly 6,000 from 2013 to 2018. Interestingly, prison admissions for drug offenses actually decreased during that same time. So 
when we talk about ending mass incarceration and what's required, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, period. But I also was heartened to see that the numbers from the state reflect that the number of prison emissions for drug cases has gone down at a time where drug filings have gone up. And so, uh, I mean, a number of judicial districts uh, have diversion um, programs, they have drug courts, and so um, my assumption is that even with the increased filings, we are having a more diversion of these cases to drug courts that are more treatment intensive, that type of thing. I mean, can you speak to that? Sure. So a couple things about drug cases that I want to mention. Representative Carver mentioned one of these things, and she's absolutely right, that diversion programs, drug treatment programs, problem-solving courts, those are having a positive impact. We need to have more of those. One of the other factors that's going to be really significant here is as of March of 2020, of House Bill 1263, we now have the desalinization of low-level possession. So low-level drug possession will go from a felony to a misdemeanor starting in March of this year. So that will obviously have dramatic impact on the numbers that we look at next year. This slide, you can't, you're not going to be able to read this slide, uh, but I left it in here anyway. It breaks down by gender, the number of filings from 2013 to 2018. And I have it on these two slides here, and forgive me for you not being able to read it, but one of the things that compelled me to keep it in there is something that is very concerning, I imagine to all of us, is the dramatic increase in the number of women going to state prison in the state of Colorado. It has been a dramatic increase. And your question, of course, is what's driving that increase? The top charge is escape. Mm -hmm. So these are individuals who are walking away from the community corrections halfway house or failing to come back in time for their curfew. And a bill is now being introduced by Representative Herod to address escape. That's what's driving the bill. So this is the product of a lot of discussion and work, including with Ms. Donner at the Prison Population Management Committee, talking about what's driving the increase in the female population in the department. <coughs> so that should be concerning for all of us when we see a dramatic fight. We should ask what's driving it. So the charges and escape was number one, and charges related to control substances was number two. So thinking about what does that mean, what trauma is involved underlying those behaviors, what's the mental health issues, substance abuse, the DOC actually has a great one-page graphic that I can send to you breaking out by gender what the needs are for the population, whether it's substance abuse and or mental health, and so on. But the rate of reoffense is one thing that I'm uh, passionate about and one thing I want to share with you. And the reason I'm passionate about it is because if we can lower the rate of reoffense, we save people from having to go back to prison. We also save people from ever being victimized. So if you're here because you're concerned about victims and you want to see fewer victims in the state of Colorado, you should be rooting for the Department of Corrections to lower the rate of reoffense for all of us, to lower the rate of reoffense for people coming out of state prison. And if you're a an elected official here under the Gold Dome, and you're a steward of the taxpayer dollars, you should be rooting for the Department of Corrections to make sure we have a successful rehabilitation back into the community. That's not what we have right now. Justin. Very real quick, Sorry. Right now, I you also have a program Yes, I do. Uh, and I think I have a slide in here on it. I may have taken it out. But so race and ethnicity, by race, the numbers. African American, Latino, and white over the last five years has gone up statewide in the prison population. And then we have it broken down by jurisdiction as well. So, for example, in Boulder, it's gone down uh, over that same five year period, but statewide, it's gone up. I think I have a slide in here on it. And if not, I can send it to you. We have it all broken down. So, the re rate of reoffense in the state of Colorado the percentage of people released from state prison. We're back in state prison within three years. Three years. 48%. So roughly 50% of all offenders released from state prison are back in state prison within three years. That means gates open this morning, 10 guys walk out, five of them are walking back in three years. The nationwide average is in the mid-30s. We're at 48%. So parole violations, reoffenses, 
number of different ways, but they're going back into the Department of Corrections within three years. And I got this number from the Department of Corrections because they had asked for an additional uh, supplemental budget increase last year. Their budget currently is $982 million. And they asked for a supplement based on the rate of reoffense, driving people back into the state prison within three years. Think about if we were just at the nationwide average, and I'd like to believe that Colorado is better than average in all things. If we were just at the nationwide average, think about the crimes that are never happening. Offenders not having to go back to prison. People not being victims. Taxpayer dollars being saved. And when we talk about parole and when the legislators talk about parole, thinking about this number, about how can we improve the process around what parole is doing for offenders and what's required for technical violation and what's driving this number. This number to me is something that concerns all of us, regardless of what group you hear on behalf of, who are you thinking of when we go through the numbers? This is something where we should be united in trying to improve the rate of reoffense and the number of people going back to state prison. Bringing that down. So I do have this still in here. So uh, prison emissions from the Boulder decrease across all racial and ethnic groups. You see statewide there the numbers for African American. Uh, Individuals went up 2.8%, 13% for Latino individuals, and 30% for white individuals. So I'm going to touch briefly on community corrections. This is a chart that highlights community corrections from the metro area. So community corrections is broken into two categories here. Uh, diversion, which means they received a sentence to community corrections as their sentence. And the next slide will be transition. So that's individuals who are coming out of state prison that into community corrections or the halfway house. And it's another slide, it's a little difficult to see. But that first blue column is diversion with a successful termination. Those numbers range from 28% up to 65%. And transition, we have a higher rate of success for transition, up as high as 70%. But people coming out of state prison transitioning through a halfway house or community corrections, as it's called, I think it's more a higher rate of success. One area that I just wanted to touch on briefly is the DAs undertook a study and analysis of habitual criminal. Is everybody here familiar with habitual criminal filings? So habitual criminal is a category in Colorado whereby if someone has uh, predicate felonies, they could be filed as habitual criminal thereby bumped into a higher sentence. <laughs> in some states, it's mandatory. So you've heard about three strikes and you're out in California from years ago. Some states, it's mandatory. The prosecutor doesn't have discretion. Here in Colorado, the prosecutors have discretion over whether to file habitual charges or not. So I just wanted to share with you the Boulder snapshot, just as an example. We had, between August and September of 2019, roughly 583 individuals who are habitual eligible. There's a small habitual and a large habitual list, as it's called. It's probably more detail than you want, but anyway. The question <coughs> is, how many of those who filed habitual charges and during that time period is just one. one? So I think when we talk about habitual criminal, asking the DAs or asking DCJ to provide the numbers of individuals who are habitual eligible, and then those are actually filed on. So there's a lot of discussion out there. And this varies by jurisdiction. So I'm showing you Boulder. We have a certain approach in Boulder where we rarely pursue habitual. The one case there from August through September was on a homicide case. So he's currently being prosecuted for a homicide. It's a complicated case. So we also filed habitual offenses. He's eligible for it. Uh, this is not true in every jurisdiction. I just want to highlight that. But it's worth asking when you hear about habitual how many are eligible and how many are filed anytime you hear in different jurisdictions. So what can we do to improve? So we talk about the increase in felony violence. We talk about the need for criminal justice reform and maintaining public safety and helping protect victims. What can we do to improve? So a number of things. First, I would strongly advocate, and Ms. Don and I give a presentation on this for the Prison Population Committee, what I call, we call, certainty and sentence. <coughs> Currently, the sentencing statutes in Colorado are very complicated. I come from, I was a prosecutor at the Manhattan DA's office uh, for 13 years. I 
for maybe the greatest move in my life. I mean, besides marrying my wife and having kids. And all that. <laughs> but professionally, coming to Colorado. Uh, I'll tell you though, our sensing statutes are really complicated and lead to a lot of misperceptions. Here at the legislature, but also in the courthouse. I feel terrible as a prosecutor, and I feel terrible for the defense attorneys. When it comes time for me to talk to a victim, like in this case I have from Loma, where when the victim's family, the 11-year-old uh, child's parents ask me, what can he get as a prison sentence? And I start to walk them through what I feel like is an algebra class on, well, here's the number, and then you add all these other numbers together, and then you start to deduct for different things, and I think you might get somewhere around here. And the defense is doing the same thing with their clients, and that makes it so hard for everyone, everyone involved, so hard for the accused, the victim, the defense attorney, the prosecutor, and the judge. And they end up having these discussions in court, and it's, I think it's unfair. These discussions in court of, judge, well, if you sentence him to four years, that really means he'll just serve X. And the defense saying, no, 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 he'll serve more than that. We need more certainty. I'm not advocating for higher sentences. I'm not advocating for that. And I'm not necessarily advocating for lower, although I could. What I'm saying for today is we need more certainty in sentencing so we can have honest discussions, including here at the legislature, about what a sentence means. Yes. Uh, D.A. Doherty, um, the truth in sentencing uh, that we, um, a discussion that happens uh, across the, the country in various states, but it, it generally means that the defendant uh, upon conviction is going to serve at least 75% of their adjudged sentence. Now, it doesn't have to mean that, but um, we have a certain number of crimes in Colorado where that's the case, but um, that is more the exception than the rule. And what I have heard in judiciary testimony is that on average in Colorado, a, a defendant is going to serve about a third of the adjudged sentence. So. Uh, for a certain level of felony that they've been convicted, you've got a, a, a range uh, for that felony. The judge uh, decides to go with eight years. That's the sentence that's announced um, during the sentencing phase. But on average, the defendant is going to serve a third of that. That is what I have heard in Colorado. Can you speak to, to that and what the experience is in, in Boulder and your DA's office? So when you hear the number you just cited, the third, usually they're talking about nonviolent offenses, which is almost intended to the state person. It's actually 50%. But I think what complicates this is people are considering inmate status and community corrections, and it makes it difficult for Department of Corrections perhaps to provide data that shows whether someone's actually an inmate or not. I know that sounds strange, but we have inmate status in Colorado. They're not necessarily an inmate in a correctional facility. <coughs> so I think it becomes harder for people to understand the, or to deliver accurate data on the average sentence. And then for violent felonies, it's a higher range of sentences. But whether it's low or too low or too high, it's just too high. And there's all these aggravators, and people are getting out earlier than judges and victims and defense attorneys perhaps expect. And it makes and or staying longer than they expected when you consider we have indeterminate life sentences for sex offenses. So I think it's, it's very complicated. There's a small working group now working on this where I'd be excited to see legislation introduced in January of next year to make the sentencing code <laughs> simpler. We will have discussions whether it should be higher sentences or lower, but just make it more simple. Because right now, I think what we're doing is a disservice to the victims and the accused and to everybody involved in this case. Another thing that I would advocate for is community support for reform. And I think there are some great groups doing this. <clears throat> so when you talk about meaningful reform in the criminal justice system, thinking about how do we get the community on board? Because otherwise, there'll be a backlash against it. So if you're a legislator and you're in favor of reform, recognizing whether the community supports it or not. So I'll give you an example. Uh, 
at the end of the legislative session in New York last year, they, in the budget bill, was inserted a, an elimination of cash bail in New York. As a result of the process, in terms of being done through the budget bill, there wasn't as much discussion or testimony at the legislature as there might have been otherwise. Whether or not it's working in New York is besides the point. It doesn't really matter for purposes of this discussion. I couldn't tell you either way, quite frankly. I read articles about it's failing, the sky is falling, we're all in danger, and then I read articles, those people are exaggerating, everything's working the way it should, this is meaningful reform, <laughs> it's growing pain, you have to get over it. But I'll tell you, I get the media clips from my old office sent to me every morning still, uh, and I just scan the headlines. And right now the headlines are, two-time robber gets out after two days, so-and-so gets out after one day, legislature now considering reversal of changes. And that, I, I, we have to avoid that. We can't have that happen. If we want to have meaningful reform, it has to be something that we believe is going to last, and that's going to work for everybody, for the people in the system, the victims, and the community. So I think engage in the community, and there are a lot of groups that do this and have discussions about criminal justice reform and the need for it and how we make it work better. What else can we do to improve, consider victims and offenders, both, as we go through this process? So, of course, in Colorado, we have the Victims' Rights Act, and then we have crimes of violence victims. There's overlap there, but they're not entirely the same thing. And then thinking about making sure that people are treated fairly and with compassion and that we have more treatment available in the system. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. But also maintaining that we have responsibility for individuals and accountability as part of our justice system. And that's a really important piece of it. Mental health services. So on any given day at the Boulder County Jail, 40% of the jail population have mental health Last year in the United States, 2.2 million people were in jail with mental health disorders. On any given day, 750,000 people in jail in the United States with mental health disorders. We started with funding from the legislature, mental health pre-file diversion programs, the only one in the state. We started in Boulder. We recently screened 415 offenders for mental health disorders. 415 people being booked into the Boulder County Jail do you want to guess how many of them screened for having a mental health disorder? 260. 200. So what can we do to make the system better? Have more resources available. Having guys like Brent cycle in and out of the jail over and over and over again, it's just an absolute failure. So thinking about how can we improve the amount of mental health services that we have. In Boulder, and it goes to Representative Carver's point from earlier, we have a really robust restorative justice and diversion program. We should have those throughout the state of Colorado. We should have them available in every jurisdiction. And I strongly believe that when I look at the data from restorative justice and diversion, it helps us with the instant case, in other words, the immediate case that we're dealing with. It also helps us keep the person from ever going to prison in the first place or returning to the criminal justice. So in Boulder, we've expanded our restorative justice and diversion program by 350%. We have a 92% success rate. And success means they comply with all the requirements, they go through whatever treatment is necessary as a part of their case, and at the end of the successful completion, the case is then dismissed. They go forward without the collateral consequences of a conviction. They have, so when they're applying for schools, for jobs, for housing, they don't have to report as having a conviction on their record. <coughs> So we've had 1,800 people successfully complete diversion in the last two years in Boulder County. We have a recidivism rate of 8.9%, 8.9. That's the kind of success we should see. And in Boulder, we can do it. Jeffco, they do it. Denver can do it. But when you get to the outlying jurisdictions where the funding is thinner and it's more difficult, it becomes extremely hard for them to have a robust restorative justice and diversion program. But doing that will help victims and the offenders and the community in the long run. So this chart just demonstrates an increase in our juvenile diversion and adult diversion numbers. <coughs> so the mental health diversion program is funded by the legislature. I greatly appreciate the action of the legislators to make this possible. There are four pilot sites in the state of Colorado now. Three are post-charging and one hours of pre-charging. 
We're expanding the criteria and we're also uh, expediting and changing the process for our mental health diversion programs. The way it works in Boulder is if someone booked into the jail is screened for a mental health disorder. If it's on a low level offense, they're diverted out of the jail, we will not file criminal charges. And they're connected with treatment in the community funded by the state. We also applied for and secured two federal grants to help us staffing at the jail and at the courthouse with this program. But the mental health diversion program, uh, jurisdictions all had a meeting uh, over at the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court building, just two weeks ago, talking about how it's working in each jurisdiction. And it's a pilot program, so it's going to have, we're going to have our growing pains, we're going to have our stumbles. But I want to share one with you because I think it really demonstrates uh, how we can continue to improve the justice system. So when we were setting up the mental health diversion program, I was asked if we would include resisting arrest and obstructing as charges for a diversion in our mental health diversion program. And I said I would talk to the police chiefs and to the sheriff, but the answer would likely be no. And I went to the meeting with the chiefs and the sheriff, and we have nine different jurisdictions in Boulder County and gathered around a table just like this, and I say, I'm being asked to expand to include resisting arrest and obstructing. I told them you guys probably wouldn't agree, but they looked very shocked. They're like, no, 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 so that's exactly who should be included in this program. What are you saying no for? These are officers who are on the street, who a guy is urinating or littering in Boulder Creek, and then the officer says something and they shove the officer. The officer has very few options at that point. <coughs> mental health diversion should be the option. We should include resistance arrest and include obstructing. <coughs> and I was really pleasantly surprised to be wrong about that and to think about how can we do a better job. And part of what we could do also is having more mental health courts and problem solving courts, which you're familiar with, drug diversion efforts. And then LEAD, CORE, and HUB, these are different names for our programs that we have in different jurisdictions around the state, where it's basically law enforcement assisted diversion. So these people aren't even hitting the courthouse, they're not being prosecuted, they're being diverted at the, on the street. Working with reentry programs, we have two reentry programs in Boulder. I think Boulder is somewhat unique. I know what you're saying. Everyone's got to laugh at Boulder. Uh, but Boulder's unique in this respect in that we have two reentry programs and they do great, great work. We should have more of those in Boulder and statewide. So as part of the Prison Population Management Committee, I toured prison facilities around Colorado uh, in the summer 2019. And what was really interesting was in each one of these facilities, they would gather groups of offenders together. And they didn't know we were coming. We told them who we were, and it was Representative Perry who would ask this question. She would say, let's assume this is your second or third time in prison. What is it that brought you back here? What is it that we could have done better to keep you from coming back? And the answer in every single group was, if we had the services we have here available in the community, we would not be back. So when we think about community corrections and parole, substance abuse and mental health, think about that. So we have people who are in prison facilities who are saying we had the same support, these same programs available in the community. We would not be back here right now. And then also crime prevention programs, making sure that things don't happen in the first place is one thing that we feel strongly about. So when it comes to helping protect victims, making sure that we have information and resources out there to keep them from ever being victimized. So I have a few minutes left for questions. I'm happy to open up. I open it up. I know I've covered a lot of ground here. On behalf of COVA, we really appreciate everyone being here. And I will say, I am really excited about where we are in the criminal justice system. I'm filled with hope right now. So I think we have an opportunity to make it better. And I, I really strongly believe, I, I hear the reformers who say we have to blow up the whole system. And then I hear those that say, if you touch anything in the system, the world will fall apart and people will die. What movie is that from? <laughs> people will die, Frank Landon. A few good men. But anyway, <laughs> your guy would have gotten that right. Yeah. It's, it's not one or the other. We can actually improve the system. Like I, I think when I talk to COVA, and my colleagues with COVA, they want to see the system improve. And public safety in hand. But meaningful criminal justice reform happens. And the folks who are reformers want to see the same thing. 
So I think a lot of the discussions that go on here at the Capitol are going to be dynamic at times. But I, I think there's a lot more we agree on on improving the criminal justice system and make it work better. Because when you think about that guy being booked into the Boulder County Jail 70 times, that story is not that unique. I've stood in court on too many occasions with criminal histories that go on page after page after page after page, page, where we have to recognize that we can do it better and we can make the system work better. And we could help people from returning to the system and help people from ever being victimized again. What questions or thoughts do you have? I would like to see us partner on providing services, but also helping those folks who commit crimes have accountability. I mean, um, when Joe and Marsha go into the prisons and talk about their experience as crime victims, and not everybody in the room gets it. But when they get it, or when we do a victim-offender dialogue and an offender gets what they've caused and that they don't, they, they're they capable of changing and not doing that. But that's a one by one by one um, event. I'm just saying. So, I agree with you. I knew you would. It has to be a part of it. And I, I also think that part of what you just hit on there a little bit leads me to think about, especially when we talk about the spike in women going to prison, we should be talking about underlying trauma and underlying issues there. What's gotten them to that situation? Right. And until we do a better job of that, we're just going to keep repeating that cycle. So, to talk to, so I went to a women's prison recently. Uh, part of that prison population management committee. And I was meeting with a group of women there and I said, I, I can't do anything to help you with what got you here, but if you have any questions or you want to reach out to me, feel free. I keep getting letters from these women now, incredible letters, where they talk about what got them where they are and how the system can be improved. Where in the letters, they're taking full accountability for what they've done. They're saying, like, I did this, this, and this. The one I just got last week was the one who embezzled money from the company she was working. I shouldn't have done it. Here's why I did it. It's completely wrong. Here are some thoughts on how to improve the system. But for people like her, how does she end up in that situation? And in the letter, she talks about her underlying uh, was a sex assault that was committed against her earlier in her relationship with the person that she was with when she embezzled the money. So the underlying trauma and how we treat that. Right? Do you have a question? Well, uh, a question, sort of a comment. When you were talking about the increase in women in prison, part of being due to escape, and I am reflecting on the uh, uh, bill that's been proposed to reduce or eliminate penalties for escape. To me, that seems like the wrong approach. What we should be asking is what's causing the escapes. What are the factors, you know, what's going wrong in community corrections that this woman feels like she has to bail? Uh, to eliminate the penalty for escape worries me immensely uh, because, you know, my family's been victimized by somebody who absconded from parole. Uh, anyway, that, that's not really a question that's common. Well, I appreciate you saying it, and there is, as Ray uh, mentioned, there's legislation that's been introduced to lower the level of offense uh, and sentence for individuals who escape. First, I would point out, and I know you know this, but this is not escape from digging a tunnel under the prison walls and coming out the other side and Shawshank Redemption style. This is someone is outside the halfway house during the day and does not go back. So they're not going back. And you're right in my opinion, that we should look at what community corrections is doing well and the things that community corrections should be doing better to help people get back on the right track. But in the meantime, I, I respect and support the idea that we need to deal with the dramatic increase in the number of women going to state prison for the escapes out of community corrections. So we can debate whether it's too far, a reduction in the offense or reduction in sentence, but I think if I were to say, Let's hold off on changing anything until we fix community corrections and improve it to a perfect 
being an entity that's a long way off. So I think looking at how we can improve how many people are going back to state prison for escape, particularly when we look at that female population increase, is something that's worth pursuing. Questions, comments? Ms. Donner? Um, I've always had um, a curiosity if we could be doing a better job in Colorado of actually tracking victimization in Colorado. You know, there's a hospital victimization survey that um, that's national, that doesn't really help us guide in Colorado. Um, we end up using a lot of other data points as proxy. Like we look at felony violence, is that what us, or are we looking at arrests or whatever? Could Colorado invest in a in depth every three years, five years, whatever, a household victimization survey. Um, so that we and that, that was a big enough sample that we could disaggregate into individual towns and find out what's going on. We could be asking people, you know, were you a, were you a victim of crime? Yes. If not, if, you know, did you report? If not, why? So we can find out some of this. Is the increase in the violence in Jeffco because it was a greater report. We have no good data, and we could be doing that as a state and uh, doing a much better job and a much more nuanced job on that. I don't think it would be super expensive to do. I mean, we did a survey of uh, 500 crime survivors just so that we could do really in depth um, questions about that. So I'll just do that, and not so much to you, but like, I feel like we're missing an opportunity to do a better job on this. But then we could be targeted if we start seeing trends that are alarming in this area or that area. We could be more nimble in our response and things like that. So it's just a throw that in the middle of the room. No, I think that's a great point. And for anybody who's picked the jury or sat in a courtroom for a sex assault trial, one of the most sobering experiences as a prosecutor is when you ask them, has anyone here been the victim of or know a victim of sex assault? Everybody. And then you ask, and what happened with that case, ma'am? Nothing. What happened with that case? I didn't report it. What happened with that case? My sister never told anybody. What happened with that case? I think she told the police, but nothing happened. I mean, it, it, it's a stark illustration of what Christy was just talking about, the number of people who are victimized that we don't even hear about. Representative Carver? You know, as we're... Um have reached our time and, and so appreciate uh, DA Doherty coming down and the presentation uh, because this is a complex area. And as we uh, look at bills like we do every legislative session that impact the criminal justice system, you know, how do we, how do we make changes in the criminal justice system that still do justice for the crime victims that protect public safety, that reduce recidivism, that provide, I mean, it is, it is may I use the word criminal, uh, the lack of substance abuse training and mental health treatment that we have in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And yeah. how many of those individuals then end up in the criminal justice system. Right. But I, I just wanted to conclude um, uh, the young man, his face just uh, popped into my head that I met at Mile High Youth Corps. They go out and do trails maintenance and do um, forest mitigation. And many of them come from challenged socioeconomic circumstances. And I was at their annual meeting in Colorado Springs, and the young man said, well, uh, they were going around and reporting, and he said, well, I had my car stolen last night. And he talked about how he had, um, he came from a poor family. He had saved up four years in part-time jobs to buy that car. And um, uh, the impact to him um, personally, financially, uh, not knowing uh, how he was going to now navigate and get to, you know, class and uh, do his work. And so it's just a reminder, even with property crimes, which sometimes we think, well, you know, nobody was injured, um, there are still real victims. 
uh, and real harm that is done and a real impact to lives. So we need to, Nancy and I were talking, in all these discussions, we can't forget that uh, we have victims of crime that are also looking for the system to give them justice, as well as how do we deter future crime and future victimization. And that always <coughs> needs to be an important part of our discussion. Well, I certainly agree. And as a prosecutor for my entire career, I feel really strongly about what you just said. And I know COVID does too. I will say one of the things I think everyone in the room would agree with in answer to how the legislators approach their work is reaching out to the various stakeholders is so appreciated. So reaching out to Christy and her team at CCJRP, I get the acronym right there. Reaching out to COVA, CDAC, the Defense Bar, for the legislators and also for their aides, that's so critically important. Because we can disagree on things, we can disagree on you know, and you disagree amongst yourselves on different things. But, and in the fast and furious world of the legislature, when we're only focused on criminal justice, but you have hundreds of bills introduced in other areas, we so appreciate all those different groups I just mentioned when you reach out. And COVA and CDAC, the Defense Bar, CCJRC, all have people down here at the Capitol who want to have those conversations to be able to give you that information so that if they know you at least consider it, because even if you disagree, I think the most frustrating thing that we have is when people, legislators, don't reach out to us, and then we're trying to play catch up. But that's why we so appreciate the opportunity to talk here today, because I think strengthening these relationships and having a robust discussion around these issues is so critically important for victims and the accused and the community. So I really appreciate you organizing this, both of you. Thank you. Yep. And thank you, and thanks to all that, uh, if you're a legislative aide uh, for one of our colleagues, we really appreciate you coming and uh, really want this to be a forum where we're presenting information from all these different perspectives. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this is